That was awesome, Jesse. Thank you. And uh, as you may have guessed, uh, the Schaffs are out of town, so I'm going to be sharing today uh, for uh, communion and the lesson. But uh, <clears throat> just really appreciate the uh, all the contributions everybody made last week to uh, Carols by Candlelight. It uh, was really, I enjoyed it. I'd been editing it and Jeanette had said there wasn't going to be any surprises. But uh, in fact, watching it in, in real time really was a, a, an encouragement and a big surprise. I really enjoyed it. I know as Larry said, this is a time of Christmas is mixed, right? It's, it's joyful, uh, but for some of us, it, it brings sadness too. You know, I know I felt some of it when you think about family members uh, either who aren't here anymore, who, uh, who couldn't be here because of COVID. But um, it really still is a time to think about Jesus and to really reflect on him and on his message. And uh, really, I know that's what the world's doing. You know, two weeks ago, we were talking about the Messiah, God with us. Remember King Jesus? Uh, we looked at, uh, at uh, Luke 24, verse 13, and passages that follow about uh, the disciples just really being discouraged. You know, they'd come away uh, thinking that Jesus was the Messiah. He was the king. That's who it was supposed to be. And lo and behold, who do they bump into on the road uh, but uh, King Jesus? And yet he, he hides himself uh, from, uh, from them so that they don't see him. And, uh, but then begins to explain from Moses and the prophets everything that the scriptures said about him. And remember, as they reflected back on it, said, you know, didn't our heart really burn inside of us, you know, when we saw those scriptures? And so today I want to I want to talk more about the beginnings, these beginnings of the kingdom of God. You know, Christmas really reminds us of just how divine God was in becoming a man. You know, he was born as a child in a major, you know, the son of God and yet holy man. But it was at this time, it was an odd time in the world because there was another king really who was in control at the time. And you recall from your history, I'm not a great student of history, I wasn't, but even I knew that Rome was the empire back then. So in the time of Jesus, it was the Roman empire. Uh, it had just until recently been under Julius Caesar. And, and most of us remember either through a little bit of Shakespeare or a little bit of, of history, you know, that, that uh, Caesar was, Julius Caesar was murdered by Brutus, right? And uh, there was this big political struggle that came out of it. And, uh, you know, there was different people who they thought were going to be Caesar. Uh, but there was one guy, Caesar Octavian or Caesar Augustus. Uh, he's mentioned in Luke chapter two, but he was the adopted son of Julius Caesar. And, and a lot of thing happened during this time when Caesar died there was a comment, you know, if you, when you get a minute, don't do it now, but you can Google Caesar's comment and you can check it out. And there was a comment in 44 BC that was, it's probably one of the largest comments that's ever been seen on earth. So it was massive. It was a star announcing the, the reign of a new king. And uh, this star uh, glowed so bright. And, uh, and of course, Octavian came up with a story, said, you know, that Julius himself had met with him and told him that he was going, that Julius was going to be God. And therefore that Octavian, who was now the son of God. And of course the Senate, the 12 senators, they realized this could be a political problem. And so they also said, uh, the story goes that, uh, that Caesar had met with them as well and said that they would be in charge with Octavian of bringing this new world order of really bringing an empire that took over the whole world. So this is the setting, you know, and in fact, if you look at later uh, Roman coins, they have the comet on the back with Caesar on the front. And so this is the, the story that's, you know, very popular sentiment about an empire, about a king, about a star. Uh, in fact, Augustus was bold enough, he created his own gospel. You know, so gospel wasn't even a Jesus word. Gospel was the word uh, that, about the proclamation of the good news of a king. And so he, he sent out this proclamation around the empire about how he was going to be the light of the world. So it's an amazing story of an empire and a king that advanced itself in such horrid means. And we know from the crucifixion of Jesus that crosses were reserved for uh, what we would call today terrorists. 
And so terrorists against the Roman Empire were the ones that were crucified. So their standing is the message of one kingdom, of one empire, of one power, of one son of God, of one gospel. And yet here comes Jesus. We, we know that Jesus in Matthew 28, what did he say? He went up on the mountain. He said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. And there he stood with, you know, should have been 12 witnesses, his the equivalent of the 12 senators, but it was 11 because of Judas. And he proclaims the good news and really calls the, uh, us to go and make disciples of all nations to expand an empire by, by a totally different means. So I want to talk a little bit about that, this today, sort of this, this kingdom message, this coming of a king in the context of the Roman Empire and really thinking of how it impacted. So if you, you can, go ahead and turn over to, uh, to Acts chapter 1, and we'll read over there in verse 3. So starting in verse 3 of Acts 1, it says, After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. You know, wasn't that really the whole message of, of Jesus was the kingdom, uh, was establishing of his kingdom? You know, you think about John the Baptist. So John the Baptist comes and says, repent for the kingdom of God is near. You know, Jesus preaches a similar message, repent for the kingdom of God is, is near or nearly here or here. Um, you know, Paul, as he went out and he spoke and he wrote, he talked often about entering the kingdom of God, the existing kingdom of God, the kingdom that had arrived, you know, really was the heart of the Jesus's movement. It was the heart of the message. It was God's purpose. And yet the disciples, you know, they walked with Jesus for three years and they still didn't get it. <clears throat> you know, they, on the road to Emmaus, as we, as we talked about last time, you know, they, they were dejected. They, it had happened and they really didn't even connect with it happening. And so Jesus comes back here and he spends time with them. He spends 40 days <coughs> teaching them about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and really explaining it to them. You know, he wanted to make sure that they got it, right? And so keep on reading in verse 4. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which has been heard, <coughs> which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, <clears throat> they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You know, they've been asking the question of Jesus, what time is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? Is this the time <clears throat> for three years? And even after 40 days, that really was still the, the question that was on their mind. <clears throat> You know, was, was this going to be the time? You know, because that's really what the Messiah meant to the Jews was not so much, a, you know, a, a person, but it was, is this the time when your kingdom is going to get restored? Is this the period? Is this the era? <clears throat> and so they'd been with him for 40 days. It still was what was on their mind, what they were thinking about. And you know, it's ironic is that 40 days, it's like a period of testing. Remember Jesus, when he went out to be tested for 40 days in the desert, it's sort of like this, this, you know, this time when you're supposed to figure it out. And in fact, you know, the, um, you know, uh, he wasn't going to leave them until they got it. So keep on reading in, in Acts 1 and verse 7, it says, he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. <coughs> You know, it finally, I think, dawned on them, you know, as we, as we know in Matthew 28, that, that they were the ones that were going to be the ones who were advancing the kingdom, that Jesus was leaving them, and they were the ones that were going to be about, going to bring about the kingdom. Uh, so in verse 9, he says, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. And so we see the ascension, you know, I, I tend to think of the ascension as it's, it's the climax, it's the end, the end of the story of Jesus. He's in heaven, and we get to go join him in heaven. 
<clears throat> but you think about it, as you tied it back, remember to G Julius Caesar's ascension story, he's going up to heaven <clears throat> and the, the Jews, the Romans, they would have heard an ascension story differently. They would have heard it's time now to go and establish the kingdom <clears throat> to extend the reign of, of the king. You know, they would have heard that you are the ambassadors. You know, that's what, you know, that's what uh, the uh, Julius Caesar's message was to his senators was go extend my reign. I think that's for us too. As you think about it, if we believe that the tomb is really empty, then we go and we extend the reign. We go and become that to the world around us, not the same way. You know, Rome, it was about military. It was about swords. It was about power. It was about empire. With Jesus, it was totally different. It was about love. It was about mercy. It was about grace. It was about compassion. It was about joy. It was about goodness. It was about self-control. Jesus is king. King Jesus, the tomb is empty. We have the power of Jesus. And I think we can get <clears throat> tied up with, okay, we, we, read, we read the New Testament because that helps us prove that he's the Messiah, <coughs> that he did these miracles. These miracles were the things that really proved that Jesus was the true Messiah. But if you think about it, if you look in the Old Testament, lots of people did miracles. Miracles just simply meant that you were doing God's work. You know, but when the Messiah comes, <clears throat> he's going to bring the kingdom He's going to bring the kingdom of God along with them. That's how you're going to know the Messiah has come. <clears throat> Let's look over in Isaiah 32. I'll, I'll throw it up for you so you can see it here. I was over at Crystal's this week and got to take a picture of the license plate. I love it. So I just thought I would talk about Jesus in Vermont. But here we go, Isaiah 32. Can, can somebody read that for me? Just go ahead and unmute whoever can and read that for us. I'll read it. Thank you. See, a king will reign in righteousness, and rulers will rule with justice. Each man will be like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm, like streams of water in the desert and the shadow of great rock of a thirsty land. Then the eyes of those who see will no longer be closed, and the ears of those who hear will listen. The mind of the rash will know and understand, and the stammering tongue will be fluent and clear. Great, thank you. So think about it. A king will reign in righteousness and rulers will rule with justice. So a king, how many kings are there? There's one, right? One king. <clears throat> See, a king will reign in righteousness. And so who's the king? King Jesus, right? <clears throat> God. I mean, extra credit if you said God, but uh, the same. It's, it's God as king. How many rulers are there? There's many. And who are the rulers? You're the rulers. You are the ones that are going to extend his kingdom. Now look at what the rulers, let's read, it, read along with me, at least you know, in your head here. It says, each man will be like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm, like streams of water in the desert and the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. <clears throat> See, that's what we're doing. If we're going to prove that Jesus is the Messiah, we need to go and extend his reign, but not extending it the way that the Romans did, but by doing this, by going out into the desert and finding people that need refuge, that need water, that need shadow, and being that stream of water in somebody's desert. All you have to do is look around you. There's people right around you that are hot, that are suffering, that are in need of the water, the encouragement, the joy, the peace, the patience, all that comes from the ministry of Jesus, from God's kingdom. And that's really how we extend his reign, is that we go to the people that are in this desert that need his encouragement, his love, 
<clears throat> his message and we extend that to them. We give them the shade, we give them the shelter, we give them the encouragement of being uh, close to Jesus, close to the Messiah, close to the encouragement that comes from <clears throat> a relationship with him. That's how we extend his reign. And I'm excited, you know, Steve and, and Sue sent out the calendar uh, for the spring. And one of the things we're going to be doing is looking at the New Testament. And it's going to be a great time to look at the Gospels to really see, I think, Book of Acts sort of acts as a, as a, as a table of contents. It shows us how the first disciples took the good news of Jesus and they went out and they brought it to a, a thirsty land. How they really took the, the, uh, the contrast to the Roman Empire and extended the rule, the power of God. Let's keep on. Let's look over at Acts chapter 5 and verse 12. I'm going to share this again. And if I can get somebody else to read this, that'd be awesome. I can read it, Peter. Great, thank you. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. Thank you. <clears throat> and so it says, it starts off and says, the apostles perform many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. Now, wait a minute. If you're like me, I go, okay, that's not me because I can't do miracles. It doesn't say they were doing miracles. It says they were just doing miraculous signs. They were doing wonders that really astonished the people. <clears throat> you know, there is there is uh, a miracle that can happen. Imagine every disciple of Jesus being a shelter and shade for people in our community. Just loving them, <clears throat> giving them help, being an encouragement. There's so many examples of that. Um, you know, I heard a story today uh, that Jeanette shared with me about a guy named Chuck Feeney. Now, all I know about Chuck is that he started a business called Duty Free Stores. You know, if you ever traveled internationally, you know, as you leave the country, you go through the last thing before you go through customs and get on your plane is they offer you a bunch of duty free stuff. Well, that was Chuck Feeney's invention. <clears throat> and so he made an awful lot of money uh, doing that. In fact, he, he amassed over $8 billion, eight with a B billion, right? A lot of money. But what Chuck decided to do is he made it, he decided, you know what? I'm gonna give away everything I have. I'm gonna give it all away. So he set aside enough for a very, you know, a, a small retirement and he set about giving away $8 billion. So he hired, he had 300 people working for him and they really tried to give it to great causes quietly with really nothing coming back to him. He didn't want it to come back to him. He wanted <clears throat> to impact the world. And so Chuck finished it up. He's actually, I think he's 80, 84, 89, something like that now. On September 14th of this year, they finished. They literally gave away every single thing he had. And so, you know, he, I think he let his 300 employees go. They closed down the office. But you know, the impact it had, you, you probably have heard of Warren Buffett and Bill Gates with this pledge that they started back 10 years ago to encouraging rich people to give away half of what they have to the needy and the poor. Well, they took it from Chuck Feeney. Chuck Feeney was the inspiration <clears throat> for that effort. And so he had an impact on people, just the giving the heart to give to worldly co worthy causes worldwide with really not wanting to be heard, heard, you know, to be given credit for it. I think, wow. That's inspiring, you know, it makes me want to give, right? Um, another one that I, I heard recently, actually yesterday, was an interview <clears throat> with um, some of the scientists who had been doing uh, coronavirus, coronavirus research back five or 10 years, over the last five or 10 years. And they, they had worked on the SARS <clears throat> virus. And so they, they had, you know, they had figured out, <clears throat> they 
and started to look at how can we administer a vaccine. And <clears throat> they had worked through the, the messenger RNA capability and they knew exactly what it would take to, uh, to immunize people uh, from a coronavirus. But going back into 2017, nobody cared. They tried to publish their, their academic work uh, in the scholarly journals and they were rejected because people thought that the next you know, danger was gonna come from influenza. And in fact, the, you know, the researchers, they moved uh, you know, from, I think they started out at Cornell or I forget exactly where, but they had, to, they had to move to somewhere else just to keep sort of this research thread going. And so when uh, things started to break out in China around Christmas going into January a year ago, uh, somebody knew of their work and, and called the lead researcher and said, hey, <clears throat> what do you think about this? You think he could help? Well, like, like any good academic, he was out snowboarding. And he said, well, you know, I think I can stop snowboarding long enough to take a look at this. And so they, as you may know, they published, uh, the Chinese published the, the DNA sequence of the virus early on back in January. And so these guys took a look at it and, and they said within 30 minutes, they knew that they could create a vaccine. Three minutes. They had been working on this for five or 10 years. They were there at the point in time when someone needed to take a look and say, hey, can we make a vaccine? <clears throat> and so about the time, you know, that you and I were talking about back March 15th, whether we should stop having service, you know, church service, because was it too dangerous to meet together? They were beginning the first round testings of a vaccine back in March. <clears throat> so that now there's a vaccine because God, I believe, <clears throat> had prepared this work, not necessarily uh, just their work, their good deeds, their trying to do the right thing <clears throat> was there in advance, ready uh, to help when help was needed. And I, I really think that's how God works. And I was thinking about just, you know, as I mentioned, it went over, we went over to drop something with Crystal and, you know, at a good distance, walked around her neighborhood. And it was amazing how all of her neighbors knew her and she is having an impact on her neighborhood, just in encouragement and loving up on them, being a light there. Uh, <clears throat> or I think about just, you know, recently when Margaret was recognized uh, with her professorship and just the impact that she's had. I mean, we know she's had a great impact on us, um, but she's had a great impact on her work community, on the community around her. You know, people that know her love her as much as we love her. And it is, <clears throat> and I really could tell a story about everybody on the screen today, whether it's you know the meters or the Hollies or the Slaters, you know I think about every time I meet a neighbor in Charlotte, I just mention either Monica or Carolyn uh, with a school-aged child, and I immediately you know have a connection because they all love those sisters uh, because they make such a great impact in the schools you know in Charlotte and and Shelburne and the area around here, <clears throat> or whether it's you know whether it's uh, the McKenzie's or Jesse or Nate. I mean, Nate, uh, just the, the man who came out as a disciple uh, in the U-Haul store sharing with everybody that crossed his path. Uh, or it's, uh, it's you know, Carl and his influence or Brenda uh, being that, uh, that light. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm glad you got the COVID vaccine. Uh, but I'm also glad that I'm lower on the list because I'm lower at risk. So <clears throat> again, I think there's a story, you know, for every person. And <clears throat> if I had more time, I, I would tell more of the stories. But I think the message is, let's not be stopped when we see that they were doing miracles. Because I think God's already working miracles. It's a miracle that somebody was working on a coronavirus vaccine and had it all ready to go, literally. <clears throat> I mean, it wasn't all done in 30 minutes, but the concept was way before this came to be, <clears throat> you know, and as the passage, you know, continues from them doing miracles, it said all the believers, <clears throat> uh, they used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join with them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. You know, that, I think that's really the story of, of this band of brothers and sisters here is that <clears throat> the world regards you highly because you bring a light uh, that's different than the light that's around them. <clears throat> And yet, nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. 
Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. You know, it's exciting. They were actually doing it. They were having an impact. <clears throat> they were extending the range, the reign of their king. Uh, they were bringing his love to all the people. They were being the shade and the water in the desert. But, you know, to be honest, as you look at this passage, there's one part that really just is a little hard to figure out. I don't know if you're looking at it in your Bible, but just the part there where it says that, that they laid people out on the streets, so on beds and mats. So it wasn't like what we've heard Steve and Sue share a lot about, about grabbing them on the mat and bringing them down through the roof, the mat bearers, to get them to Jesus. In this story, the mat bearers, they just drag people out in the street and leave them there waiting for Peter to walk by. Now, be honest, that seems a little crazy, doesn't it? Just me? It's a little crazy that the idea that it was Peter's shadow might fall on them, and that would be enough. Look over here at, uh, at a, back at a passage we looked at already. Let's look back at, uh, in, in Isaiah. <clears throat> and it says, See, a king will reign in righteousness, and rulers will rule with justice. Each man will be like a shelter from the wind and refuge from the storm, like streams of water in the desert and the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. Well, I've heard one person say that, well, you know, what's Peter's name, right? We all know this, right? We use this, on this rock, I'll build my church. So Peter's name was Rocky, right? He was the rock. And so here's the shadow of the rock healing people. Now, I got to believe that maybe Luke was even, as he wrote this down in Acts, he's going, yeah, that reminds me of Isaiah 32, where there's going to be a rock in a thirsty land. And its shadow is going to have this healing influence on the land. Pretty amazing, right? Pretty crazy. Um, you can, uh, I like it. I like the idea there. I'm sure it would have been fine for his shadow to heal them too, but I I think the idea that Isaiah was bringing out that, that Peter was going to be the example of that shadow that was healing people, that was helping them, uh, he was extending. So I think, you know, the story is that if you want to go and prove that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the king, that he's the Messiah, then do what, this, do what Isaiah says. Go out and find people in the desert. Go out and find them and extend the shadow to them extend the love to them, bring that cup of water to them, <clears throat> do that to help them, do that to impact them, do that to love them. Uh, and you know what will happen then? Take a look at, you know, in verse three there in Isaiah 32, what will happen then is that the eyes of those who see will no longer be closed and the ears of those who hear will listen and the mind of the rash will know and understand and the stammering tongue will be fluent and clear not because of your abilities, not because of your excellent words, although I'm sure you have abilities and I'm sure you have excellent words, they're gonna see your example. They're gonna see an example of how you love people. So that's really the story of the book of Acts <clears throat> is when the church fulfills the scriptures and not just Jesus. Go be his witnesses, go be Jesus in Vermont. That's how God, that's how the kingdom is going to be proclaimed, not by our miraculous deeds, but really just by us being that rock that provides a shadow, that stream that provides water, that love that encourages somebody, that joy that lifts their spirit, that comfort that helps them through a tough time. That really is when we're going to make a difference. That's when we're going to have an impact. That's when the kingdom is really going to be proclaimed in Vermont, uh, is when we take that act of extending the reign of the kingdom, that we don't make it about the, the, the star of Julius Caesar and an empire and a power, but we make it about the star of Jesus, the light that really came to light the world with a different way, a different way of loving people, a different way of impacting them, a different way of showing them the Father and bringing them <clears throat> into the kingdom. Uh, I want to finish out as we, as we take the time of communion over in Matthew 28 and verse 16. And I'll read it. It says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when he, they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. 
Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority on, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Let's pray for communion. Father, it's, uh, it is just an encouraging time right now to think about how much you loved us, how much you gave in giving Jesus to be uh, our Savior, to be our Lord, to be our King, to be the example really of what it means to love other people, to what it means to be able to, uh, to make a, just an incredible sacrifice uh, to love and, and save other people. Well, I pray that as we, as we <clears throat> take the uh, bread and the juice and remember Jesus, I just pray that you'd help us to connect our hearts with your heart. Help us to really see your call to, uh, to make you king of our lives, uh, to love you that way, but then to extend that kingdom to those around us. Help us really to feel your heart, uh, <clears throat> to connect with your love, to really be able to give it to others, and most of all, to really just see how Jesus loved us enough to give himself for us. We love you. Just grateful for this time of communion. Uh, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.